Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of members of Cambridge Neuroscience. Cambridge Neuroscience is currently going through quite a detailed consultation process to develop six new themes for the research we do here. Each of the next 12 talks will come from one of the six new themes, two from each. For more info on the themes and the talks covered in this series, please follow the links below and follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro. Today we are delighted to welcome Dr. Steve Edgeley, who will be talking to us on the theme of neuron circuits and networks. Steve is a reader in the Department of Physiology, Development and Neuroscience and a Fellow of St. John's College. His lab is interested in how movements are controlled by neural circuits and today he's going to talk to us about his work on the recurrent problems in spinal cord and cerebellar circuits. Well, recurrent problems in spinal cord and cerebellar circuits about the problems that come from thinking about circuits that produce recurrent inhibition. And uh, most of you will have heard, of, heard them called recurrent inhibition, but there are, there are a couple of examples. The first point that's always struck me is when you look at anatomy is just how common recurrent axon collaterals are. Um, many, many neurons, particularly projection neurons, seem to have recurrent axon collaterals. Here are some Purkinje cells with axons. Their branches go back up and connect with mostly other Purkinje cells, apparently, within the cerebellum. Here are neocortical pyramidal cells, layer five pyramidal cells in sensory cortex of a mouse. They have axons that go back all the way through the cortex. And here even are retinal ganglion cells. Now, why would retinal ganglion cells send axon collaterals to talk to other cells? So this is a general problem. I don't think there's a, a single answer. Of course, the Purkinje cells are inhibitory, whereas these pyramidal cells are excitatory. So thinking about what they do might be based largely upon their actions. So I think one of the reasons why I'm interested in this is that um, one of the oldest circuits that we know of uh, was described by this man. This is Birdsey Renshaw. Um, and he described a spinal cord circuit involving recurrent collaterals. Now, he was quite a young person when he began working in electrophysiology in the 1940s, when he spent much of his time trying to make glass micro pipettes to do intracellular recordings in the spinal cord. And the technology wasn't quite there when he was working. I mean, he, he got a plum job in the Rockefeller Institute in New York to develop a research lab and worked. He recruited people, got great equipment, but then very unfortunately, um, his wife got polio, he caught polio and died very quickly. So he died very young, having made some preliminary observations on functions within the spinal cord that he, he, couldn't, re he couldn't really analyze in great detail. Um, about 10 years later, this person, John Eccles, who I think is known to everyone in Cambridge because he shared the Nobel Prize with Hodgkin and Huxley, um, Eccles refined this technique of using sharp microelectrodes to record in the spinal cord. He identified some of the cells in early recordings that Renshaw had made and gave the name to the cells that he described as, uh, from in, in memory of Renshaw. He called them Renshaw cells. So, so Eccles has a, a, a kind of, I have a kind of a link to Eccles in a way because Eccles did much of his work immediately after the Nobel Prize with this person, who's Anders Lundberg, who set up a department in Sweden, and he recruited a postdoc called Elsbieta Liankoska in the late 1960s. And among many other people, Elsbieta had a scruffy British postdoc. Um, uh, well, she was about 60. And that was that was so I have a link through this this chain of work and an interest in Renshaw cells. Now, maybe not all of you know much about the spinal cord, so I'll just mention some basics of spinal cord circuitry. This is a cross section through the spinal cord. The neurons live in the center here, which is the gray matter, and sensory axons come in through the dorsal roots to, to, to the dorsal part of the spinal cord and make terminals in there. The motor neurons live in the ventral part of the spinal cord, send their axons out through the ventral roots, and in between these is a jungle of interneurons that that connect sensory fibers with motor neurons and fibers descending into the spinal cord from the brain that, that connect to these neurons. And 
the enterprise of spinal cord electrophysiology for many years has been trying to identify types of cells here and identify something of what they do. Now, Renshaw, unfortunately, during his experiments, had a, a set of technologies that often led to many of these neurons in the dorsal part of the spinal cord dying. And so in his experiments, these small, deeper neurons were the ones that he spent most of his time studying. And these were the ones that Eccles, Eccles later showed to inhibit motor neurons, and he called them Renshaw cells in, in memory of, of Renshaw. And this is the, the cells that I, um, I want to say a little bit about because they mediate what we call recurrent inhibition. So usually the circuit made by these cells is represented in these kind of stick diagrams. Here's the motor neuron. Motor neurons send their axons out. They go to muscles, make um, neuromuscular junctions and make muscles twitch. <clears throat> but they give rise to branches within the spinal cord that excite these little neurons, Renshaw cells. And the Renshaw cells <clears throat> in turn inhibit the motor neurons. Um, now, this diagram is very misleading. We use them all the time for simplicity, but actually the motor neuron here represents a pool of three or 400 motor neurons. Um, and the Renshaw represents a group of, 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 of interneurons connecting to those motor neurons. So a more realistic view might be something like this. Some motor neurons neither give nor receive Renshaw inhibition. Um, some both give and receive Renshaw inhibition. Some just receive it and some just give rise to collaterals, which, which excite Renshaw inhibition. So among a group of motor neurons, there's a much more complex set of uh, much more complex organization. Um, motor neuron pools of most of your muscles are associated with Renshaw cells and therefore the motor neurons receive recurrent inhibition with the exception is, is tongue muscles and extraocular muscles, the muscles that move your orbit of your eye. Um, a lot is known about the connectivity of Renshaw cells, about their neurochemistry, and in particular, recently, a lot is known about the developmental programming, the mechanisms through which these develop in the embryonic spinal cord. But what's missing really is, is function for these. And the, the, the function of Renshaw cells is largely based on speculation, based on the connections that these cells, based on that little stick diagram that I've just given you. Um, that, the reason for that is it's very hard to look at the action of these in vivo when movement is taking place. You know, the, the analysis, just finding these neurons, recording signals from them requires usually anesthesia. It requires reductionistic experimentation where we, we have to do invasive studies on the cord. Um, <clears throat> Here's an example of that function. This is Wikipedia, the oracle. It says, in, ess in essence, the Renshaw cells regulate the firing of the alpha motor neuron leaving the ventral horn. Well, anything inhibiting motor neurons is going to regulate it in some way. This is conceptually, they remove noise by dampening the firing frequency of overexcited neurons. So it suggests our motor system overexcites things and then has to have a mechanism to stop them from being excited, which is a, a slightly unusual concept in a way. Um, <clears throat> So this is really a slightly vague thing. We'd like to know much more about exactly what Renshaw cells do. So much of the, um, much of the thinking about what Renshaw's do, Renshaw cells do in the past has been based on the circuitry in the spinal cord that we know of. And I've just done a schematic diagram of this showing, for example, a joint with a flexor muscle in red and an extensor muscle in green. So the motor neurons innovating the flexor muscle here in red have recurrent collaterals that excite Renshaw cells, which inhibit the motor neurons. So that's a fairly simple circuit. And we have the same thing on the extensor side here. Um, <clears throat> and another major element of spinal circuits is we know that primary afferents of muscle spindles make monosynaptic connections with motor neurons. So I've drawn these in here. Um, but these muscle spindles also make connections with another group of neurons called 1A inhibitory neurons, which project to the antagonistic motor, to the motor neurons of the antagonistic muscle group. Now, these are often called, these were, when they were first discovered, these were called corresponding neurons because they seem to have all the same inputs as the alpha motor neurons, that means they get Renshaw cell inhibition. So the Renshaw cell inhibition, and then I've drawn one on this side, but I haven't drawn its axons because this gets to look too much like the 
the flight paths of British Airways flights. Um, a final element that, that, that is common in many of these circuits is that Renshaw cells inhibit each other, that the Renshaw cells of extensor muscles are inhibited by the Renshaw cells of flexor muscles, and the Renshaw cells of flexor muscles inhibit the cells of extensor muscles. So this kind of circuit um, has been described through a lot of work. Now, most of that work has been done in the cat hind limb, and this is a kind of diagram of the skeleton and the principal musculature of the cat hind limb. Each of these brown lines represents a different muscle in the hind limb. And <clears throat> from this work, the diagram that I've just shown you previously has evolved and uh, recurrent inhibition was found to be particularly strong between synergistic muscle groups. That is, for example, these muscles with similar geometry that do similar things. Um, a lot of emphasis has been put on flexors versus extensors. And a major hypothesis arising from these studies is that Renshaw cells are part of effectively what's like a, a canonical circuit of the spinal cord, um, which uh, Holtborn called the motor output stage. And that is that this, that the, when, when the muscle works, it works because of a whole network of neurons within the spinal cord that interact with each other, rather than just because of one particular of those neurons driving activity and that the network as a whole is regulated largely by Renshaw cells. So Renshaw cells are setting the gain, if you like, of information flowing from inputs through to the muscles. And in particular, the Renshaw cells are involved in balancing activity between antagonistic muscle pairs. And this includes in locomotion. So we have that alternating activity. Now, that probably largely arises because this structure, the hind limb of a cat, <clears throat> really does locomotion. That is what it does. It partakes in a number of <clears throat> stereotypic type behaviors where the muscles act in patterns working together, either to walk, to trot, or to gallop, or perhaps to sort of rear up or to pounce, those sorts of movements. But they, they involve coordinated activity of these muscle pairs. These muscle pairs are not active individually in a very flexible way. The hind limb tends to work with stereotypical type behaviors. And that is perhaps reflected in those connections. Okay, a second hypothesis that's been around for a long time is that Renshaw cells act to suppress tremor and to make movement smooth. So when first recruited, most motor neurons tend to fire at around 10 hertz during weak contractions. And any inputs that tend to synchronize the firing of motor neurons can drive tremor. Now, tremor at 10, about 10 hertz is a major problem for fine movements. And I thought what I might do is, um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute. I can ask you to have a go at um, putting your finger out like a gun, pointing at some object in the distance and try and move your finger very, very slowly from one side of the room to the other. Move it really slowly, bending the joint, bending the knuckle joint very, very slowly. And um, although you don't have it handily, here is a, here is a skewer. And a skewer kind of amplifies that. So if I try and point at the screen with a skewer and make a very slow movement, you can see tremor very effectively, many of the components of which are at about 10 hertz. So this is a major problem for smooth movements. And in fact, I had a graduate student a little while ago who had such tremor that he couldn't do dissections. So it can be a major problem um, for accurate, fine movements. Um, this is an illustration of that recorded. This is a, one of my favorite papers by Valbo and Vesperi many, many years ago. They asked um, subjects, human subjects, to make those same very slow movements um, or make movements at slightly different speeds. And you can see that all of these movements are wobbly in terms of position. And when they look at the velocity of the movements, they can see the movements are made up of little jerky movements at about, and if you look at the frequency, it's around 10 hertz. So this form of tremor is intrinsic in many fine movements. So an I, one idea is that Renshaw cells may be there to reduce this tremor. Now, a problem with these idea about Ren, ideas about Renshaw cell function is that our experimental data is either about single cells or about connections. And what we really want to know is how these cells act in 
a, a, a live situation when we're making a movement. And current technologies don't let us observe these cells under those technologies. So I'm going to. So the way it has been approached um, <clears throat> is by a Cambridge, former Cambridge Part Two neuroscience student, Liz Williams, who went up to Newcastle, hence people from Newcastle are here, um, <clears throat> um, where she did her PhD. And a major part of that was to build a realistic computational model of a muscle involving about 400 motor neurons with Renshaw cells. Now these were accurate. This was an accurate biophysical model that actually modeled the system as a whole. This schematic diagram is taken from their paper. So inputs coming from the cortex are fed into motor neurons, which have realistic properties and in turn connect to muscle, well, to motor units, which generate forces that can be summed to give you a measure of the force that the, 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 the model generates. And also it generates action potentials um, in those motor units, and they can be summed as motor unit action potentials to generate gross muscle EMG. And a Renshaw cell, Ren Renshaw cells are fitted into this layer with inputs from the motor neurons and outputs to the uh, outputs to the motor neurons, with inputs from the recurrent collaterals and outputs, inhibitory outputs back to the motor neurons. And this is the sort of data that comes from the model. Here's the cortical input, um, motor neurons tending to fire at around 10 hertz, which is realistic. Renshaw cell spikes driven by those recurrent collaterals. Here's the EMG and here is the force. Now, the great thing about the model is you can conveniently take out Renshaw cell inhibition. And just as a, a single example, here is motor neuron spike synchrony um, at different frequencies coming from the model. Now, the model without Renshaw cells generates signals represented by the black lines with considerable synchrony at 10 hertz, um, more at 20 and 30 hertz. Now, when the Renshaw cell is put in, the red trace here arrives with the 10 hertz oscillation is substantially decreased. Um, but the strange sort of unusual thing is that at 30 hertz, the, the uh, correlated firing of motor neurons is increased. Now, this is interesting because there had been previous models, not so sophisticated, but some of those had suggest, suggested suppression of motor neuron synchrony. Some had suggested increases in motor neuron synchrony. So this model supports the idea that recurrent inhibition suppresses low frequency synchrony among motor neurons and therefore suppresses tremor. So this is a model and you know many people look at models and think well models are you know something that's built in a computer how do we know it's accurate and so the question is how can we validate it well um, we had the opportunity to do this in the last few years and we've looked at the distribution of Renshaw cell inhibition in the upper limb so the only direct information we have about Renshaw cell connections that comes from direct recordings to date is from the hind limb of the cat and from some limited information in mice, but not very much. And in both of those cases, the hind limb is used in stereotypical activities, which have limited flexibility. So we were interested to define connectivity in the upper limb, which is involved in much more flexible activities, such as manipulation. Uh, so here is a diagram of an upper limb, the skeleton of the upper limb, and we've got blocks of muscles, and we these are innervated by different nerves, so we can ask about motor neurons projecting to these different muscles and which other muscles they receive recurrent inhibition from. So here's our experiment, all done under deep anesthesia. Um, we cut the dorsal roots, so we stop any sensory traffic into the spinal cord. We use sharp micro intracellular recordings from identified motor neurons projecting to those different, the different group of muscles that I showed earlier. And then we can stimulate these different muscle nerves and ask about Renshaw cell inhibition in the different motor neurons. And there were two objectives to this. Um, the first was to stimulate different muscle nerves. So we're trying to define the contribution, distribution of recurrent inhibition between different muscles. Is it like the diagram that I showed you earlier between flexors and extensors? And secondly, um, we were able to deliver Poisson distributed stimuli to activate recurrent inhibition at a range of different frequencies and ask about the transfer of that information through to the motor neuron membrane potential at a range of different frequencies. So 
this is the type of recording we made. Um, these black lines at the uppermost lines represent intracellular recordings. The lower traces are just recordings from the surface of the spinal cord that tell us about when we delivered stimuli and the effects of those stimuli. So this is an antidromic action. This is an action potential generated by stimulating the peripheral nerve of a muscle innervated by the median nerve stimulated at the elbow. So this is a, either a, a, a wrist or a long digit flexor muscle in the forearm, one that brings your wrist up towards you when you bend your wrist up when you, when you move it. Um, <clears throat> now, the interesting thing just in this one finding is that we have a large IPSP, an inhibitory potential, evoked by stimulating the deep radial nerve at the elbow, which innervates the extensors. So here we have a Renshaw cell activated by a flexor muscle generating recurrent inhibition. Uh, sorry, um, uh, we have a Renshaw uh, uh, inhibition produced in a flexor of the forearm produced by an extensor of the forearm. So it doesn't quite fit that pattern of flexor versus extensor organization. Uh, furthermore, another observation was that in, in many motor neurons of proximal muscles like shoulder girdle muscles, we have large IPSPs evoked by stimulation of motor neurons that act much further distally, for example, in the wrist and on the long digit muscles. So here extensors and here flexors. Um, this is all recorded in a, mus in a motor neuron which must be innovating one of the shoulder muscles. So this is a long distance away from its origin. Now the pattern of these is something complicated to see. This represents the size of IPSPs if, if, coming from these muscles in these uh, different, uh, different types of muscles. The, this is probably a bit too complicated. So uh, the size of these symbols represents the largest of the IPSPs. The small symbols represent small ones. Here is the frequency with which we saw connections. And you can see some of these ones that were large here are also large here. And if we multiply the two of these, which gives you some evidence of the strength of this effect overall, the frequency and the size of these effects, we can see that these large proximal muscles, shoulder, and, shoulder muscles and arm extensors have the biggest effects and that they come also from these, um, they, they come also more strongly from the more proximal muscles. Uh, that's perhaps a bit hard to see. Let, this diagram shows some of this. Um, for each group of muscles, these arrows represent the, the large arrows represent the strength of um, the stronger recurrent connections. The small arrows represent weaker recurrent connections. No arrows represent no recurrent connections. So the distribution is far from what was described for the cat hind limb, and it's hard to see how it would fit with the motor output stage model for function of recurrent inhibition. So the recurrent inhibition was much stronger in proximal muscles. The big arrows tend to go to shoulder muscles um, and the smaller arrows tend to go to more distal muscles. And note that no arrows come from or go to the intrinsic hand motor neurons. I think of all the cells we tested, there was the pairs we tested, there was only one example of effective recurrent inhibition coming from an intrinsic uh, muscle of, of, the, of the, the hand. So in terms of distribution of inputs, um, we find a distribution that doesn't really fit the motor output stage and we find a distribution skewed towards proximal muscles um, and across many joints, which is a little bit different to the motor output stage idea, which is about single muscles or synergists at one joint. In terms of the transfer of frequency, um, uh, the frequency relationship between the Poisson trains and the motor neuron potentials, this is the coherence, which is a correlation between the frequency of the Poisson train and the motor neuron potential uh, at different frequencies, and uh, it follows this curve like this. Um, now, this is unphysiological. We're stimulating muscle nerves to put a jolt into the system, but we can make a comparison between this and the same stimuli or the same Poisson train stimuli injected into the computational model used by Williams and Baker. And these are the coherence 
plots that we get when we do that, the two different colors represent different durate or different rise time EPSPs in the Renshaw cells. But we can see that they fit reasonably well. They seem to, to fit reasonably well. Now, an important measure to make as well is the phase of this frequency relationship. The phase of the empirical data is shown here. And again, these three lines, rep or the, the green and the red line, represent the phase relationship for the model when we use short or medium length um, uh, rise time EPSPs in Renshaw cells. So just to, I'll just skip over that and just say these findings indicate in a limb that's highly special by, for specialized for flexible skilled movements, recurrent inhibition differs greatly from the pattern described in a limb that's specialized for locomotion. And importantly, recurrent inhibition doesn't obey the flexor pattern described in the cat hind limb. And the empirical data obtained from our motor neuron recordings during Poisson train stimulation uh, matches well with the outputs of the computational model when the same, albeit unphysiological, stimuli are given to them. So this pro provides evidence that the computational model is accurate and therefore supports the idea um, coming from the model that low frequency synchronization between motor neurons are suppressed by Renshaw inhibition um, or recurrent inhibition mediated by Renshaw cells is correct. So that's an interesting sort of look at a, an example of a recurrent inhibitory pathway, which uh, has been described in the spinal cord and is, is, exists and has been ex existed for many years, has been studied for many, many years. Um, another pathway that's relatively similar, I think, has some similar lessons to take home about how you might go about studying a neural circuit. This is a cerebellar circuit. And here is a, a, the cerebellar circuit that I think most of you will know, Purkinje cells projecting out, um, climbing fibers and mossy fibers projecting in. But we're interested now in this connection of Golgi cells and granule cells, which interact with each other. So if we take this out, oops, and just look at this connection, uh, this looks rather similar. We have granule cells which feed output axons that go off to Purkinje cells and all the other types of cells in the cerebellar cortex, but also connect with Golgi cells, which are inhibitory cells projecting back to the granule cell. So we have again a negative feedback pathway. Um, excitation of the granule cells produces excitation of the Golgi cells, which inhibit the granule cells. So it, again, it's a, a, a pathway that, if you like, reflects the same organization as the Renshaw pathway. There are many differences, of course, but just bear with me. It's it, the same sort of organization exists. Now, because of this organization, based on this connectivity and this, this set of connections, um, the idea has sort of arisen and been widely accepted that Golgi cells mediate a kind of a gain control over the flow of information through the granule cell pathway into the cerebellum. Increases in activity in the population of granule cells will increase the firing of the Golgi cells because they excite them and that increased inhibition will then counteract the increased activity in the population. So we're effectively governing the flow of information through granule cells to all the other cells of the cerebellar cortex. That's an idea that was based largely on the connections. It came from Eccles, was uh, reinforced by David Marr and, and James Albers, and many people have worked on that basis ever since. Well, we had an opportunity to look at that with in vivo recordings from Golgi cells. And so we can identify cells as Golgi cells through juxtacellular labeling. Here's an example of two of them. Like all the cells in the cerebellum, they have a characteristic morphology. They have dendrites here, which collect inputs from parallel fibers of granule cells. And these, this mess down here is literally thousands of boutons, of inhibitory boutons made onto granule cells. So input coming from granule cells to these dendrites, output onto the granule cells through this inhibitory bouton. That's the sort of, if you like, recurrent inhibitory circuit of uh, Golgi cells. When we record from Golgi cells, we find that they do respond to focal mossy fiber input with brief 
short lasting excitations. And here's an example. This is a, this gray line is a stimulus to the vibrissi, the tri a trigeminal afferent stimulus. Um, we see sharply timed, very reliable action potentials at fixed times uh, generated by these stimuli. Here are a group of different stimuli. This is a raster and a post stimulus time histogram of these responses. They're reliable responses at fixed times generated reliably by these stimuli. However, um, these were relatively rare. And the most common finding we had was that Golgi cells respond to stimulate a peripheral stimuli with a depression of spiking that means they can fall silent. Now, uh, that sounds a bit unusual, but most of you may, may, many of you may be used to neurons that don't fire, but Golgi cells fire all the time. Uh, they discharge continuously in many different conditions, in brain slices, in awake animals, and in anesthetized animals. They keep firing at a low frequency, usually around 10 or 20 hertz. And so these cells would be firing. We deliver a stimulus, and the cell shuts up its firing with a long latency. It's taking, you know, taking nearly 200 milliseconds here for them to really become um, low, their activity to drop far. And this stays low for a long period of time. Um, so we saw this depression in cells across much of the cerebellum. And so it's a powerful and very common finding in Golgi cells. Now, of course, the interesting thing here is what, what causes this inhibition. Um, now, that we can work something out by looking at the distribution of it. These depressions of Golgi cell firing can be evoked by stimulation of very wide receptive fields, including all of the limbs, forelimbs, hind limbs, uh, trigeminal afferents, the whole lot. All of these contributed to to uh, these long lasting depression responses of Golgi cells in these um, in, in our experiments. These responses are evoked by low threshold afferents of mixed nerves. So this, this T, the, the stimuli are delivered here with different strengths and the T represents the threshold for the largest, fastest conducting fibers in the nerve. And so at 1.5 times threshold, we're activating for example, most of the large A alpha and A beta fibers in peripheral nerves. And we can evoke these depressions from those low threshold afferents. Equally, this depression of Golgi cell firing can also be caused by heating the skin to a temperature that activates nociceptors. And we've also done this with direct stimulation of C fibers when we block A fiber conduction um, in other experiments. So. So we have here then um, Golgi cell firing being depressed by a, a wide dynamic range type stimuli, um, low threshold stimuli through to nociceptors and from large parts of the body. So that suggests that it's getting its input through anterolateral systems, the, the sort of, if you like, the, the, the nociceptive pathways passing into the body, but they also get low threshold tactile input as well. That may explain the wide receptive fields. Are these really important, this Golgi cell suppression? Well, here's evidence that it is um, important for granule cell firing. This is, uh, these are spikes recorded juxtacellularly from a granule cell. And we filled the cell afterwards, and this is the, the granule cell sitting in the uh, cerebellar cortex. And we can see that when we deliver the stimuli that would generate long lasting suppressions of firing in Golgi cells, we see granule cell spikes appear with the same sort of timing as that suppression of firing in Golgi cells, suggesting that these granule cells are disinhibited when we stop the Golgi cell from having tonic activity and allows these cells to fire. So that's just a piece of evidence. This is hard to get, but we've got reasonable evidence that this happens, that these granule cells which are normally silent, can fire when this broad range signal inhibits or suppresses the firing of the Golgi cells. Now, of course, so these Golgi cells responded to focal tactile stimuli with brief, well-timed and uh, well-timed and uh, reliable excitation, but they also responded to stimuli from almost anywhere on the body from wide dynamic range systems. And these project via a diffuse system um, 
arising from the lateral reticular nucleus in the brain stem. Now, I've not put any evidence here for that, but I could provide it if you like, because the person who provided that evidence is Wei Zhu, who's, who's in the audience. So, so Wei showed that uh, lateral reticular nucleus seems to be important for those long lasting suppressions of firing of Golgi cells. Now, the lateral reticular nucleus has been known for many years to be what's called a diffuse system projecting to the cerebellum. Its axons project very widely to large parts of the cerebellum, and it has a wide range of different inputs. But it's not been understood really what its function is. There are not many hypotheses about its function. Now, using anaphoresis, we provided evidence that the long-lasting depression depends upon inhibition generated by glutamate through extrasynaptic metabotropic mgluR2 receptors, which are found on Golgi cells. And that this, uh, we, we have evidence that this at least um, represents part of the um, effect that we see generating long-lasting suppression of Golgi cell firing. So the view that we have of this is that these focal low threshold um, inputs from tactile systems coming from say the trigeminal system project through this conventional pathway exciting granule cells which excite granule cells largely through AMPA receptors but that these more diffuse systems project through granule cells that connect to mgluR2 receptors to inhibit the Golgi cells. Now I've not put any synaptic connectivity here because this may be through direct connections that release glutamate from the parallel fibers further up, or it may be a spillover effect. That's, uh, that's not very clear, but we have evidence at least for these two separate systems. A second finding here is that we've known for some time that stimulation of the other type of afferent into the cerebellum, climbing fibers, also produce a depression of firing in Golgi cells. And here's an example taken from Wei Zhu again, who worked in my lab as a PhD student. Um, here we're stimulating at time zero in this post-stimulus time histogram, we stimulate the axons of climbing fibers in the ventral brainstem, and we produce a reliable silencing of the Golgi cell for a brief period of time. Now, this is surprising because no one really has good evidence for connections between climbing fiber afferents and Golgi cells. And in fact, Elisa Galliano, who's also, I think, in the audience, um, studied this and spent some time looking for this and failed to find substantial evidence for strong synaptic connections between climbing fibers and Golgi cells. So this is a sort of a slight conundrum. How do climbing fibers have this action? And I think that the, this was answered fairly recently by um, the laboratory of uh, Wadiche in, in Alabama. He showed that spillover glutamate from climbing fiber activation also activates mgluR2 receptors onto Golgi cells to suppress their firing. So it looks like, so I said it's shown that it looks as if spillover glutamate from stimulation of climbing fibers also suppresses the firing of the Golgi cell. So the role of Golgi cells becomes much more complex. So the focal recept receptive field and sharp response, well-timed responses of Golgi cells could well generate a negative feedback system as proposed based on the initial connectivity. But Golgi cell firing is powerfully influenced by these um, other systems, climbing fiber systems and the lateral reticular nucleus, which gives rise to a really profuse set of mossy fiber terminals projecting into the cerebellum, which we think are acting via these mgluR2 receptors. So clearly, the function of the Golgi cell has to take into account these two suppressive and activating um, uh, pathways. So the system that excites and the system that inhibits the, the Golgi cells. Now, the balance between these two types of effects it is really difficult to address experimentally for a physiological situation. So they could work for in suppressing the flow of information through granule cells to Purkinje cells, but they could equally, if this inhibitory pathway is important, be enhancing the flow of information through granule cells into the other cells in the cerebellar cortex, including the Purkinje cells.
Okay, so I've illustrated two cases where relatively similar simple feedback circuitry turns out to be much more complex than was initially thought. And in both cases, I think the problem has been limited information on the connections in the circuit. So for Renshaw cells, these have really only been studied um, in cat hind limb, which has a very stereotypical organization. And for Golgi cells, um, the connections from mossy fiber pathways to Golgi cells have largely been assumed to be, if you like, heterogeneous. So all inputs go to all neurons. The ev evidence that we have here suggests that some of the granule cells are carrying information about focal tactile information um, and others are carrying information about diffuse activation but those involved in diffuse activation may well be suppressing the activity of the Golgi cells rather than producing a if you like a negative feedback they're, they're they're enhancing the output so in both of these cases I think function of these can only be revealed by analysis of all the elements um, and a way forward, I think, is shown by Liz Williams and Stuart Baker's model, where we can have a realistic model and we can take empirical data to put into a model as well as using the model to work out what might happen physiologically. Now, working out which of these system operates in vivo through experimental intervention is going to be extremely difficult. Um, yeah, so that I think it's food for thought, I think, I hope. Um, so I just want to say thanks to the people I've worked with. For the Renshaw cells, is obviously Stuart Baker and Liz Williams were the key movers. And for Golgi cells, this was done by Tal Holtzman and particularly Wei Zhu, who, uh, whose work I've uh, presented here. Okay. Thank you, Steve, for that very insightful talk. Don't forget to join us next week when we will welcome Professor George Malaris from the Department of Engineering here at the University of Cambridge. George is the Prince Philip Professor of Technology and his research focuses on organic electronics and bioelectronics and he will be talking to us about electronics and the brain. So don't forget to follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro to keep up to date with all that is happening in neuroscience and sign up for the rest of the talks in the series on the links shown here. See you next time.